Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Safe to Serve Live. I'm your host, Andrew Henriquez, with my co-host, Hillary. My wife Hello. is here with me today. Yes, happy to be here. Long time. Yes. You know, friends, I want to play off the scripture in Isaiah 40, where it says, uh, they that wait upon the Lord, <laughs> they that wait upon safe to serve, shall renew their strength, mount up with wings as eagles. You get what I'm saying, friends. Long time coming, we have been talking about launching these new programs, and they are finally here. Right, Hillary? Yes, that's right. <laughs> and as we can see, the signs of the last days are here. These new programs that we are going to roll out are timely and necessary, not only to speak about the last days, but how practically we can get ready, get our family ready, get others ready, as we can see the mark of the beast is soon to be enforced, the second coming of Christ is even at the doors. Hillary, what good news for the people. All right, so we definitely want to whet your appetite for what is in store, what is forthcoming, we are going to be dealing with topics such as country living, conversion, of course, evangelism, medical missionary work, how we can prepare ourselves individually, also our families, how we can prepare our young people to stand faithful in these last days. We're going to be dealing with topics such as mental health, physical health, spiritual health, obviously. And what's really exciting, we're going to be inviting individuals on this set to share their testimony, their stories of how God has wrought mightily in their behalf, how he's delivered them, how he has really brought conversion into their hearts to encourage all of us in these last days. And friends, when these series start, I want to let you know that we're going to be on time. And it's not going to be operating on Jamaica time. <laughs> now, earlier we had some technical difficulties, but we're here by God's grace. Now, as Hillary just outlined, that several series are in the pipeline to be rolled out one after another. But there's one that we are going to launch, what, next Monday by God's grace? By God's grace. Next Monday That's by God's grace. And you need to hear what is about to be served from the Lord's table. Speak to us, Hillary. All right. So I'm going to keep our viewers in suspicion for just a little while longer while I take a moment, if you'll indulge me, to, to roll down memory lane, go back down memory lane. Hmm. So I'm thinking back. It's just so nice to be on this set with you. It's been a long time that we've done this. I'm thinking back to the very first video that we actually did together yes. back in Florida. I won't tell you how many years ago, but it was several years ago, actually, before our daughter Faith was born. And so... We did our first video together, and then we did subsequent videos, Prophetic Insights. Then we started doing Thursday night presentations here and there. And that launched us into the Great Controversy series that, that we did. that went for one whole year. Yes, we did all 42 chapters. That was really a, a great, great series. And then we had another series following that, dealing with um, marriage. Reconciliation. Reconciliation through the sanctuary. Yes. And so I, I'm a bit nostalgic as I sit here with, with Andrew here, just thinking back of, you know, our earlier videos. And so it's, it's just good to be here. So without further ado, I'm going to now tell you what the so new So why were series... you absent? Because, fr <laughs> friends, don't blame me why my wife has been ha absent for the past several months. We will years, speak more on years. years. <laughs> we, we will speak more on that shortly. But for now. Let's get right into what's coming. All right. So wait no longer, viewers. We are going to be dealing with dress reform. Dress reform is a very uh, important topic for us in these last days, especially. And so this is something, like Andrew has said, it's been a long time coming. This is something that the Lord has laid on my heart years ago that we wanted to do. But, you know, I believe nothing happens before time. You know, so everything is according to God's timing. So God orchestrated everything and put the pieces together so that now is the time for us to finally be able to launch this all-important series on the topic of dress reform. Now, some of our viewers may be wondering, is this uh, series only for women? And I would say absolutely not. So our male viewers, don't worry. 
most of the topics, I would say 99.9% .9 of the topics are going to deal with dress reform for men, women, children, boys, girls, everyone. All of the topics will overlap. There will be about 0.1% where we specifically address females. But, you know, Andrew, you as a pastor, you have dealt with dress reform from the pulpit in your baptismal classes. The Sabbath school teachers, they've dealt with dress reform as well. And that's very important. And it's necessary. It's actually something that God would have ministers to do. Uh, however, I feel that what is also needed is dress reform from a female perspective. As someone who has studied this topic extensively and still studying, still learning, still growing, and as a woman that can encourage other women that are along that journey, young women, old women, women in all stages of life. And so to give that female perspective, but again, this study is for everyone, not just women. All of the principles will overlap and deal with both male and female. And friends, some of these uh, series that we're going to be addressing, some of them will run consecutively, others will run concurrently. And uh, this one that is about to be launched, I can encapsulate it with the words from early writings on page 67, where it says, time is almost finished. And what took our pioneers years to learn? we will have to learn in a few months. And we Sorry. also have much to unlearn. unlearn and much to learn again. It was today, as we were prepping for this presentation, three emails came in. Pastor, when are you starting the dress reform series that you have been speaking about for the past several months? Well, friends, we're here. It's about to be rolled out. And as you're being blessed, I'm going to ask you kindly to share the videos with other people that they too can learn. In a statement coming from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 465, this just shows how important it is for us to address the topic of dress reform. It says, not one in 20 of the sisters who profess to believe the testimonies has taken the first step in dress reform. I would like to comment on that and also the previous statement you made from early writings. With, that's one of the purposes of this series is to educate God's people because there is a serious need for it as there's a serious lacking. And I often ask myself the question, is it because of a lack of education why we're dressing out of harmony with God's people. And for a, a lot of people within the church and, of course, outside of the church, it would be a lack of education. For others, it may just be rebellion or maybe they're, they're fighting with it, struggling with it. And so it's very important that we deal with this topic. And as you just read this statement from volume one of the testimonies, this says not one in 20 of the sisters. Now, this isn't a blanket statement that just says sisters in the world, or it doesn't just say sisters that profess to be Seventh-day Adventists. If we look carefully, it says not one in 20 of the sisters who profess to believe the testimonies. Now, we know among Seventh-day Adventists, there's people that don't even know about the testimonies. There's another class that outright will say, I don't believe in the testimonies. I go by the Bible and not the spirit of prophecy. And when we say testimonies, we're referring to the writings of Ellen G. White. Many of those, so this says not one in 20 who believe the testimonies, profess to believe. So these are people that profess to study and read the testimonies, which dress reform is all throughout, from volume one to volume nine. It's in the conflict of ages. It's all throughout the writing. And when you look at this statistic, it's very, very startling. So what about those who are baptized SDA, but don't read, nor do they believe in the testimonies? What would that, what would that ratio be? Right. Not one in 20? Not hmm. one in 20. Not one in 100, right. if you put everyone together. Because that ratio is worse. That's right. Out of every 100, not one? Yeah, who believe the testimonies. And when you look at that statistic, one in 20 is 5%. This says not one in 20. So that means less than 5% of the sisters that believe, profess to believe in the testimonies. And it says have taken the first step. 
And I want to play on that first step. So there's different steps in dress reform. And that's one of the reasons why we're launching this series. I don't believe that we can cover the totality of dress reform in one part, two parts, three parts, four parts. There's steps Keep going to it. five parts, six parts. How yes. many parts you have? Like, <laughs> friends, almost, <laughs> I have returned home several evenings. And my wife has said to me, I've added one more part to this series. Is this going to be for one year, Hillary? If the Lord allows, if the Lord says so, and if there's more principles to share, because we really want to educate our From people. From head to toe. Yes, we're going to be dealing with uh, every topic. We're going to leave no stones unturned by God's grace. And so we will also have opportunity for questions and so forth. But um, let's move on. Here. It says here in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 648, there is a terrible sin upon us as a people that we have permitted our church members to dress in a manner inconsistent with their faith. We must arise at once and close the door against the allurements of fashion. Unless we do this, our churches will become demoralized. And it needs to be stated that the first sign that Adam and Eve had sinned in the Garden of Eden was that their apparel, their dress changed from the pure to the impure, the holy to the unholy, the modest to the whorish garment. And ever since it has been God's plan to clothe us physically, yea, even spiritually, with the robe of his righteousness, practically and spiritually. Now, as you said that, that reminds me of, I, I want to talk about the title of this series and why we've entitled it um, this way. In Zechariah chapter 3, um, and I believe it is verse 6, I want to say, and this is where the title of the series comes from. It's actually verse 4. It's going to be called Change of Raiment. Now, when you look at the term, the phrase dress reform, Reform means to change, right? So dress reform is a change of raiment, a change in the dress. So we're calling it change of raiment. That's a biblical term. So, of course, dress reform is in the Bible. And I'll just give a quick summation of Zechariah chapter 3. One of my favorite passages, it's, it's just so beautiful, the illustration given. You have Joshua the high priest, not Joshua the successor of Moses, but you have Joshua the high priest, which represents God's people as a whole. He's standing before the angel of the Lord, and he's arrayed in filthy garments. And who is there standing on Joshua's right hand to buffet him, to accuse him? Satan. Satan is right there on his right hand, pointing out his filthy garments, telling him all the reasons why he cannot be saved, why he is unworthy, etc. But then if you go to verse 4, as I said, it says, And unto him he said, Behold, I've caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And that is so beautiful. And if you go up to verse 3, verse 3 actually says, the angel says, which is Jesus, he says, take away the filthy garments and give him a change of raiment. That's what God wants to do with us. As you mentioned, what he wanted to do with Adam and Eve to um, clothe them with his robe of righteousness in a spiritual sense, he wants to do that with us in a physical, literal sense. Many of us because of ignorance, as we established before, others because of rebellion, you know, we're dressing out of harmony with God's principles, grossly out of harmony with God's principles. Therefore, we have on filthy garments. We have on garments that are not approved by God. But God does not leave us in our nakedness. He does not leave us in our filthy garments. He supplies for us. He imputes, like we learned Sabbath, right? He imputes to us his robe, his change of raiment. And that's the beautiful thing about God. He never takes something away from us, something sinful away from us without giving us his ideal, without giving us something better. We find that in Genesis, as you um, referenced Adam and Eve, when they put on their filthy garments, their fig leaf garments, what did God have to do? He took away those garments. He gave them a change of raiment. He gave them coats of skin. Likewise, all the books meet and end in Revelation. When you go to Revelation, you see the very same thing. The Laodicean, the message to the Laodiceans, 
How are they found before God? They are naked. They are naked. They are naked in God's sight. They have on no garments. They have on filthy garments, as it were. But God doesn't just say you're naked and cast them out. He says, I counsel thee. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire and white raiment. So he always supplies that which we need. So if there's anyone out there that's struggling with dress reform, and we will deal with the specificities of dress reform, you know, step by step, as we said, um, God will not just leave you destitute. He will supply that change of raiment. He will show you how to dress, and he will also mm. give you the resources to be able to dress according to his word. Friends, you can hear the passion oozing out from my wife, Hillary, here. You can also hear the appeal a few moments ago. In Testimonies, Volume 6, page 96, it says, one of the points upon which those newly come to the faith will need instruction is the subject of dress. Let the new converts be faithfully dealt with. Are they vain in dress? Do they cherish pride of heart? The idolatry of dress is a moral disease. Hmm. Can we say even a pandemic? Mm. It yes. says a moral disease. It must not be taken over into the new life. Amen. In most cases, submission to the gospel requirements will demand a decided change in the dress. Amen. Powerful statement. Yes, it is. Change of raiment, right? That's what we're dealing with. And so this deals with the new converts. This is yes. one of the reasons, as we've talked about educating God's people, this is one of the reasons why uh, we feel that it's necessary to bring this before the people because it says these are one of the topics that new converts should be educated on. You know, as I look at that statement, I think about a conversation that I ha I've had with my mother. She had a pastor, and I believe it was his very first sermon when he was being installed um, as the pastor. And he said, there are several topics that I'm not going to address as a minister. Mm. And he said, I'm not going to talk about health reform. And he said, I'm not going to talk about dress. And by and by, this very pastor brought in dress down Sabbath. So every, I don't know what it was, every fourth Sabbath or whatever, one Sabbath out of the month, they would have dress down Sabbath. People would come in shorts. They would come in jeans. They would come in just regular sweats, you know, things they would wear, you know, outside, go to go exercise. What about in. the pastor? Would he also dress down? Oh, yeah. He would dress down mm. as well. Jeans and T-shirts and so forth. And again, where and, in the Bible do we find the priest dressing down as he's ministering the sanctuary. You don't find it. And, you know, I, I'm so thankful for Save to Serve and the ministry that God has given to you because um, before you baptize souls, you make sure that they have a thorough education, not only of the doctrines and the fundamental pillars of our faith or any, and everything like that, but also the standards of our church. And you go through a thorough, in-detail study of dress reform maybe two or three sessions on dress reform so that the people understand that as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, yes. as Bible-believing Christians, God has a dress code for his people. He has an ideal in how we should dress. And when you look at the majority, well, the majority, I can say that confidently, of Seventh-day Adventist churches, when they're preparing people to be baptized, if they go through a series of studies, Dress reform is not one of the things that they study. Therefore, they baptize people with jewelry, makeup. They baptize them dressing like worldlings, dressing out of harmony. I don't want to give too much away because we're going to be dealing, like I said, in specifics. And we'll tell you what some of the topics that we'll cover are, um, in the series a little later on. But it's very important that uh, new converts... And what's sad and unfortunate is that the new converts, in many cases, don't have a godly example of how Christians should dress because when they look around, they see third generation, fourth generation Adventists sometimes dressing just like they're dressing. So it's not just the new converts, again, that need education. Remember that first statement we Correct. opened with, not, not one, one in 20. 20 of those that profess to believe the testimonies. We would call those present truth. So a lot of those in present truth who profess it are not dressing accordingly and they're giving a wrong example to new converts and thus it perpetuates this uh, immodest dressing. And it's not just on the issue of modesty. 
masculine dressing for mm. women, feminine dressing for men, dressing unhealthfully, dressing slovenly, because the spirit of prophecy also talks about that, sloppily, dressing extravagantly, you know, and so we have to get back to studying the word of God. We have to get back to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And what happens is when we don't address these issues over and over again, what happens is the people become lax and they no longer believe that it is necessary. That's right. But the more we keep the reforms, the standards in Christ before the people, it will be a constant reminder. Don't backslide. Remain on the straight and narrow path. And this is why we want to encourage people because many people who have accepted these reforms, mm -hmm. they did. Yeah. But because Christ's second coming has delayed longer than they expected, what happens is they have begun to go backward, mm -hmm. more becoming like the world. Yeah. So we're here to encourage the people who have begun the journey following God's standards just remain patient, hold on. He that shall come will come, will not tarry. Because the moment you begin to take off the robe of righteousness, mm -hmm. to go back into the world, that may be the very time when Christ says, you are joined to your idols. Let them alone. Yes. And let me just say this on that point. You said a, one reason why many have backslidden on the point of dress reform is because of the apparent delay in Christ's coming. Yes. And another reason would be that they see the example of older members, they see the example of ministers' wives, even ministers themselves, and they see them dressing a ministers certain wives? way. Ministers' wives? Yes. Come on, Hillary. Yes, maybe that needs to be another part, yes. ministers' wives. But anyway, um, they see the example of some of those that profess to believe the testimonies, they profess to believe present truth, and when they see them dressing a certain way, oh, well, that's um, Pastor So-and-So's wife. If she can wear such and such, that's then correct. there must not be anything wrong with me wearing, you, you name it, whatever it may be, sleeveless, pants wearing for women. I don't want to go too much in detail because we are going to be specifically dealing with those very issues. Friends, as you can see, uh, my wife here, she, her cup, the Lord has given to her, it's full. And she's ready to pour out the blessings to the rest of us. We're told in Testimonies Volume 4, page 636, perhaps no questions has ever come up among us which has caused such development of character as has the dress reform. And Volume 4, page 647 says, fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedience to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. What a statement. Both statements, powerful, potent, solemn, startling makes you examine yourself. You know, when I read the Bible and I read the spirit of prophecy, I look for superlative statements. I look for comparative statements. And when you go back to that first statement, it says perhaps no question has ever come up among us which has caused such development of character as has the dress reform question. So you think in your mind, think about some of the questions that have come up at, to us as a people, some of the important doctrines so dress reform is an issue of character development. And we will find all throughout the spirit of prophecy that dress is an index to the heart. Many times, and even in the Bible, when you see someone dressing out of harmony with God's principles, it's indicative of a heart condition, a heart that is far away from God. It's indicative of people being in a rebellious state. And again, this is not going to be condemnatory. It's to encourage because we all, you know, we didn't arrive where we are overnight. You know, there were some struggles that, that I've had personally along the way with dress reform. Andrew can tell you that. He was the one that brought the message to me in the first no, place. No, I won't tell them but, that. It's between us. I won't <laughs> tell you. 
It's between us. Yes, but but if God can do it for one, he can do it for all. So Amen. don't think we're going to use this series to beat people over the head, but we are going to be showing you uplifting the standard because God doesn't bring the standard down to meet us. He lifts us up to meet the standard. And if he calls us to do it, he will empower us to do it. And with that said, I want to say, I'm going to go back to the quotes. My cup is running over, so I'm kind of, but I want to say that the foundation of this study is not going to be my opinion. It's not going to be my preference. Oh, I like this style of dress, so you have to do it. No, it's not going to be any of that. It's not going to be based on a man. It's not going to be based on a human being. Whatever is presented in this series, it's going to be based on a thus saith the Lord, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Isaiah 820 says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you now as a listener, as a viewer, you need to go back to the Bible. You go back to the testimonies. You be a faithful, faithful, noble Berean. Go back and study these things out and see if these things are so, whether these things are so. And if you take issue with any of the principles, guess what? Your issue will not be with me. Your issue will be with the word of God because everything shared will be based on the word of God. That is the foundation of this study. Say on. You, All right. You know, when we think about, when we think about these reforms God has given to us, they're not only for us. Mm -hmm. They're also to be a witness to other people in various religions yes. and those who are not now a part of any religion. Do you know that there are some people in various religions who will never accept Christianity because they view Christianity as just as worldly as the world, yeah. the worldling. Right. And some of them in other religions or even some denominations, mm -hmm. they espouse Bible dress reform. Yeah, and they don't even have the testimonies. Correct, correct, mm -hmm. correct. They understand modesty and clothing of the limbs from mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 3. Right. And they're looking to see who has the light. And once they see it, they will leave their false religions mm -hmm. and even leave the world as professed atheists and join with the people of God. Right. So dress reform and health reform, all the other reforms are given to us as evangelistic tools That's right. to win souls. Yes, and that brings me to another reason why, there's several reasons why the Lord has put this burden on my heart. You know, not only because dress reform has been such a blessing to me, and I will sprinkle my testimony throughout the series, but it's been a blessing to me, but also to use it as an evangelistic tool. You know, when I think about individuals dressing out of harmony with God's principles, especially as professed Seventh-day Adventists, especially that same group that profess to believe in the testimonies, when we see people dressing out of harmony, it really brings a reproach on the work. It brings a reproach on the Word of God, and it brings a reproach on Seventh-day Adventists. You know, I, again, I think back to my mother. Uh, we talk a lot about dress and just everything, really. But she was sharing another account with me that her mother and her, her mother had shared with her. Her mother, which is my grandmother, she was walking with a pastor. I don't know where they were or what have you, but the pastor said to her, he saw two ladies walking, and the pastor said to her, hey, there's one of my members. And my grandmother said to her, which mm -hmm. one? Or said to him, rather, thank you. Which one? She could not tell. They were both decked out in jewels. They both were dressed just like the world. There used to be a time that Seventh-day Adventists were known for three things. People of the book, people that knew the Word of God, people that knew the Bible, people that were health reformers, very health conscious, and dress. People could look and they could tell, that is a Seventh-day Adventist sister. That is a Seventh-day Adventist brother. You know, friends, just based on the dress. The Lord come back. The Lord needs a people, even a ministry that will fulfill the words of Jeremiah 6, 16, mm -hmm. verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand you in the ways and see, ask for the old path. Mm -hmm. Where is the good way? Walk therein, you shall find rest to your souls. When Elijah comes, mm -hmm. he turns the hearts yeah. of the people back to God's word. Amen. And that's why 
Safe to Serve Live and the new programs we are going to roll out consecutively, concurrently, are so important. Yes. And back to my grandmother, and then I'll wrap up that point, and then we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. <laughs> but I could go on and on. That's why we have a 15-part series, 15-plus ellipsis. But, um, yeah, back to her, she could not tell. And um, I, I thought about this statement in Volume 1 again, the same Volume 1 that talked about not one in five of our sisters. It talks about people, individuals, Adventists walking in the broad road. And they had on their garments, dead to the world, the end of all things are at hand. Be ye also ready. They were in the broad way, mm -hmm. yet profess to be of the people who were in the narrow way. But those around them would say, there's no difference between mm -hmm. us. Right. We are alike. We dress. We talk. We act alike. That's right. And as you mentioned, other denominations and other religions, it's really unfortunate to see that there are, I believe, apostolic, or there's certain denominations. These aren't even Sabbath keepers. Church of God sometimes. Church of God. These are people that don't have the sanctuary the world, message. The world is watching Seventh-day Adventists. Mm. It knows something of their profession of faith and high standard. And when it sees those not living up to their profession, it, the world, yeah. points to us with scorn. That's right. Volume 9, 23. So it, it, really, it really hurts our witness as Seventh-day Adventists. When we go out there and we tell people about the Sabbath, we try to tell them about health reform, we give them great controversy, we give them ministry of healings and books from the same spirit of prophecy author that uh, writes about dress reform, they aren't going to want to hear anything from us if we, we look just like they look. We have the same clothing. We have the same appearance. And there's no growth. There's no growth. So how are we going to witness to them about anything, really, and we're not living up to the principles of God as it relates to dress reform? But back to that um, second quote on the page, you know, talking about fashion is deteriorating the intellect. It goes on to say... And eating out the spirituality of our people. Yes. Obedience to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches mm -hmm. and is doing more than any other power to separate our people yes. from God. That's the statement. I, that's the last phrase there that I wanted to um, look at. I said I like superlative and comparative words. It says here it's doing more than any other power to separate our people from, from God. God. Yes. That's fashion, the power of fashion. People are slaves to fashion. And you know something? When you think about it, there's false doctrines. There's spiritualism. There is music, there is all kind of things that are separating people from God, but what does it say is doing more, more than the false doctrines, more than inviting, you know, Babylonians into our churches to give messages. Obedience to fashion. So dress reform is essential, and it is an issue of salvation. Contrary to what some people teach and believe, it is an issue of salvation. Before you close, I know we have run over time. Take your time. Let's do, well, Take your time. don't tell me that. <laughs> I'm long-winded. I get that from my husband here. <laughs> but I want to say here that let's talk about some of the topics that we're going to be sharing. All right, so we are going to be dealing with modesty, of course, nakedness. What is nakedness according to the Bible? Um, we're going to be dealing with simplicity of dress versus extravagance in dress. We are going to be dealing with makeup, cosmetics, jewelry. We're going to be dealing with uh, androgynous dressing, women wearing pants, men wearing dresses, right? I said it's not just going to be f for ladies, it's for everyone. Dress reform for children, dress reform for labor, right? Uh, dress reform while exercising. Mm. Yeah, that's a big one because a lot of, well, people lay it on the shelf when they work and when they exercise. Dress reform at home. We have to be examples at home. Dress reform in the house of God. We are going to be dealing with the hair. Yes, the broidered hair. We're going to be dealing with a lot of, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. We're going to be dealing with even the shoes, high heels, the feet, covering the extremities. I can go on and on. Like I said, there's lots of parts to the series, so you'll just have to tune in uh, every, well, whenever we drop drop it, and we are going to be going systematically so that we can 
um, know what God's word says on these various topics. So if I were to encapsulate all that I just said, <laughs> we're going to be dealing with dress reform from the crown of the head all the way literally to the soles of the feet. And we'll be answering questions. So probably the last of the series, if you send in questions, we can um, address those questions. All right, friends. So Monday, Monday at mo what time? Uh, well, save to serve time. So stay tuned. <laughs> Mo no, Seven no, no. o'clock? God's time. God's time. God's okay. time. Okay. <laughs> so next Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time is when we will roll out part one of change. Change of raiment. Of raiment. All right, friends. There's so much more to share, as you can see, but we are going to cut it short in righteousness. Thank you for making the sacrifice to tune in. We had some technical difficulties earlier, but praise God, we are here, all right? And, uh, of course, send in your comments, like, share this so others can be edified, enlightened, be blessed, be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ and live truly as God's people, a light in this world. At this time, kindly... Bow with me as we say a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this opportunity to serve you and to serve others. Thank you for your power, your love, your mercies, your long suffering. May we be faithful to you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercies. Prepare us for this spiritual journey to live for you and to share you with others. Save us, we pray. We thank you for salvation. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless, and by God's grace, I will see you tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern for Midday Power Surge.